Vikram Parmesh. This audience is most delighted that Vikram Seth is here today. This migrating bird's not been sighted here before, but stumbled in this way. Of course, we mustn't fail to mention that this event's not by intention. We'll spare him any inflicted blame if Bachi happened to complain. When invited to a Litfest dinner by Firoza, I traipsed downstairs, we stood in the heat, there were few chairs, the evening proved to be a winner. As Sudha, Vikram and I conversed, but in literature we weren't immersed. Sudha, of course, was so inclined. But Vikram's interests are so wide that though for literature she pined, a theorem's proof was supplied. Now Max makes Vikram quite excited. And hearing this, I swiftly cited Maths for poets. So apropos, now little did dear Sudha know that platonic solids would be discussed, but Vikram mentioned there were just five. That's when I challenged him to strive for proof. Sudha must have cussed. But I, of course, just thanked fate that I had met a true soulmate. Vikram desired another meeting. He wished to get to know Bombay. He had all his friends competing, each one on a different day, exposing some unusual facet. So what could be my special asset? Now trudging in the heat was burned, and so my mind busily churned. And in a stroke of easy brilliance, it struck me that my Bombay's nub could be a trip to every club that wouldn't stress my frail resilience. And Vikram quickly scooped the ball and dubbed the trip, what else, club crawl. <laughs> now Rutty joined the expedition, but found the club crawl rather tame. And so we modified the mission. For minor changes, I was game. Bombay was still a steamy oven. I nixed Dobie Gart, but not Money Bhavan. <laughs> which Vikram thought was very cool. While walking past Breach Candy's pool, a poetic star was recognized by a fascinated fan. Her masters was about our man. All three of us were so surprised. We watched the sunset with a drink, the club's specialty rather pink. <laughs> Bacardi splashed in pomegranate, a fruit resembling a grenade. These days, who knows, someone might ban it. <laughs> Explosive cocktails can be an aid to creative thought and thus inspired. At Willingdon Club, he inquired if they could claim a special drink. None was proffered. But I do think when Naryal Pani got a mention, Wickram rocketed up and away. Bacardi again was brought in play, and that, dear friends, was the invention of Dabardi, Vikram's portmanteau name. We both enjoyed this cocktail game. While on the lawn, we had Belpuri. What food could be more Bombay? We topped it up with Akuri, then toured the club, and on the way, the portraits of the Willingdon stared condescendingly so we shared an incident from long ago that all of us appeared to know of Lady Willingdon and Jinnah's Rati. <laughs> Lady Willingdon offered a rap, but Jinnah wouldn't accept such crap. Deep decollete doesn't make one slutty. <laughs> and so the response was very bold. My wife will decide if she is cold. I donned an imaginary bonnet to discover my feminine side and ensure a Pushkin sonnet. Although I'm known to occasionally slide into a son, Vikram's appellation for my strange masculine deviation. And I'm delighted that we could grab Vikram for Godrej Culture Lab. Let's call him for a Friday funda where the audience is open and large, with impresario Parmesh in charge.
before Vikram begins to wonder whether this will go on much more, I'll graciously concede the floor. The two poems, two, uh, two uh, tales from uh, the Panchatantra, that's India, then two from uh, Chinese uh, uh, folk tales, two from uh, Greece, Aesop's fables, two from the Ukraine, and then two that I make up myself. So the two that I will read, one is probably an Indian one, and one, or maybe I'll read The Hare and the Tortoise, uh, which is a, 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 an Aesop's table, a fable with a twist. Once or twice upon a time in the land of Rani Rhyme lived a hare both hot and heady and a tortoise slow and steady. When at noon the hare awoke, she would tell herself a joke, squeal with laughter, roll about, eat her eggs and sauerkraut, then pick up the phone and babble, gibble gabble, gibble gabble to her friends, the mouse and mole and the empty headed vole. Hey girls, did you know the rat was rejected by the bat? Good for her, the rat's a fool. Oh, I think he's kind of cool. Too bad, darling, now he's dating Lady Lemming's maid in waiting. What, that hamster, you don't say. Gibble gabble every day. Gibble gabble everywhere went the mouse and mole and hare. Gibble gabble, gibble gabble. Oh, what riffraff. Oh, what rabble. But the tortoise, when he rose, daily counted all his toes, twice or three times, to ensure he had neither less nor more. Next, he'd tally the amount in his savings bank account. Then he'd very carefully count his grandsons. One, two, three. Ed and Ned and Fred by name. And his sermon was the same. Eddie, Neddy, Freddy, boys, you must never break your toys. You must often floss your gums. You must always do your sums. Buy your own house, don't pay rent, save your funds at 6%, major in accountancy, and grow up to be like me. Listen, Eddie, Neddy, Freddy, you be slow, but you be steady. One day by the fauna fountain, by the noble mammal mountain, where the ducks and ducklings dabble, hare and mouse went, Gibble gabble, gibble gabble, look who's coming. And the hare began a humming and the mouse began a giggling. Well, it isn't Samuel Pigling, that's for sure, or Peter Rabbit, or Sir Fox in hunting habit. Even hedgehog roly poly wouldn't ever walk so slowly. Inch by inch by inch, he's crawling. How pathetic, how appalling. He won't get here in an hour if he uses turtle power. Teddy tortoise, go and grab tram or train or taxi cab, squeal the hare. I have no doubt you can shell the money out. And at this disgraceful pun, hare and mouse both squealed with fun, ran around the tortoise twice, fell into the fountain thrice, swam and sang out as they swam. I'm a tortoise, yes I am, see me swimming, glug, glug, glug. I'm a tortoise, no, a slug. Now the tortoise snapped the air and addressed the hare-brained hare. Madam, you are rash and young and should mind your mindless tongue. Doubtless, madam, hares exceed tortoises by far in speed, but were we to run a race, I, not you, would win first place. Slowly, surely, I'd defeat you. Trust me, madam, I would beat you. Darling tortoise, drawled the hare, I would thrash you anywhere. Marsh or mountain, hill or dale, field or forest, rain or hail. Snap the tortoise slow and steady. Choose your place and I'll be ready. Choose your time and make it soon. Here, the hare said, Sunday noon. So at the appointed time, all the beasts of Rani Rhyme, every reptile, bird or mammal, from the koala to the camel, gathered to behold the race. Bet on first and second place, gobbled popcorn, guzzled beer, and exclaimed, they're here, they're here. At the starting block, the steady tortoise flexed his toes, quite ready, but the flighty hare, still wearing her silk nighty, kept on staring at a mirror while the press took her words down, more or less. <laughs> Young reporters sought her views for the rhyme and runny news. What's at stake besides the honor? Is the tortoise ma'am a goner? Why did you agree to run? Is the race already won? Pouting out her scarlet lips, 
sweetly wiggling head and hips, making wolves feel weak inside. Languidly, Ms. Hare replied, Teddy Tortoise, don't you see, has this awful crush on me. Why, he thinks I'm simply stunning. That's why, darlings, I am running. And I've staked the cup I won when I was Ms. Honeybun. Who will win? Why can't you tell? Read the lipstick on his shell. There she smeared a scarlet two and the words mock turtle stew. Soon the starting gun was heard and a secretary bird gently murmured, it's begun, ma'am, perhaps you ought to run. No, the hare laughed, oh no, no, Teddy Tortoise is so slow, let him have a little start. I don't want to break his heart. But the tortoise plodded on like a small automaton, muttering as he held his pace, I have got to win this race. Two hours passed. In satin shorts, a cut for fashion more than sports, a Ms. Hare once again appeared, yawning softly as she neared two o'clock. My beauty sleep. Ma'am, the race. The race will keep. Really, it's already won. And she stretched out in the sun. Two hours passed. The hare awoke and she stretched and yawned and spoke, where's the tortoise? Out of sight. Oh, the hare said, really, right, time to go. And off she bounded, leaving all her friends astounded at her brahmos fueled pace. <laughs> at her rocket fueled pace. <laughs> sure, they said, she'll win this race. She was out of sight already on the heels of tortoise Teddy. Suddenly, the dizzy hare saw a field of mushrooms where champignon and chanterelle mixed with devils of the dell. Uh, this last mushroom, I suspect, has a cerebral effect. <laughs> Every time I eat one, I feel I'm floating in the sky. <laughs> How delicious, what a treat, said the hare. I'll stop and eat. So she did. And very soon, she was singing out of tune. And she lurched towards the wood, shouting to the neighborhood, boring, boring, life is boring. Birdies, help me go exploring. Let's go off the beaten track. In a minute, I'll be back. Off the hare went, fancy free, one hour passed, then two, then three. But the tortoise plodded on, now the day was almost gone, and the sun was sinking low, very steady, very slow, and he saw the finish line, and he thought, the race is mine, and the gold cup was in sight, glinting in the golden light, when with an impassioned air, someone screamed, look, look, the hare, and the punters started jumping and the tortoise heard a thumping close behind him on the track and he wanted to look back. For the hare was roused at last and was gaining on him fast and had almost caught him up and retrieved her golden cup when the tortoise, mouth agape, crossed the line and bit the tape. Not quite finished, but it needs a little pause. After the announcer's gun had pronounced that he had won, and the cheering of the crowd died at last, the tortoise bowed, clasped the cup with quiet pride, and sat down, self-satisfied. And he thought, that silly hare, so much for her charm and flair, so much for her idle boast. In her cup, I'll raise a toast to hard work and regularity. Silly creature, such vulgarity. Now she learned that sure and slow is the only way to go, that you can't rise to the top with a skip, a jump, a hop, that you've got to hatch your eggs, that you've got to count your legs, that you've got to do your duty, not depend on verve and beauty. When the press comes, I shall say that she's been shell-shocked today. What a well-deserved disgrace that the fool has lost this race. But it was, in fact, the hare, with a calm, insouciant air, like an unrepentant bounder who allured the pressmen around her. Oh, Miss Hare, you're so appealing when you're sweating, said one, squealing. You have rendered gold and booty to the shrine of sleep and beauty, breathed another, overawed. And Will Wolf, the great press lord, 
filled a gold cup on a whim with huge rubies to the brim. Gorgeous rubies, bold and bright, red as cherries, rich with light, and with an inviting grin, murmured, in my eyes, you win. And perhaps she had. The hair suddenly was everywhere. Stories of her quotes and capers made front page in all the papers, and the sleepy BBC, Beastly Broadcast Company, <laughs> beamed a feature with the news, all the world lost for a snooze. Soon she saw her name in lights, sold a book and movie rights, while a travel magazine bought the story, sight unseen, of her three-hour expedition to the wood called Mushroom Mission. <laughs> Soon the cash came pouring in, and to save it was a sin, so she bought a manor house where she lived with mole and mouse. And her friends, when they played Scrabble, gibble, gabble, gibble, gabble, gibble, gabble, all the way, let her spell compete with K. <laughs> Thus the hair was pampered rotten, and the tortoise was forgotten. <laughs> Um, for the last reading, actually, I think I'll read something with quite a different mood. But it'll, it'll also it'll be the second Greek fable. This is uh, called the, um, the Eagle and the Beetle. It's also an Aesop's fable, but um, somewhat different. Um, and this is just to make you walk slowly and thoughtfully out of the hall. A beetle loved a certain hare and wandered with him everywhere. They went to fairs and feasts together, took walks in any kind of weather, talked of the future and the past on sunny days or overcast, but since their friendship was so pleasant, lived, for the most part, in the present. One day, alas, an eagle flew above them, and before they knew what cloud had shadowed them, the hare hung from her talons in mid-air. Please spare my friend, the beetle cried. But the, excuse me a second. Oh yes, the hare is a protagonist, but it's called the eagle and the beetle. I thought I couldn't possibly have two poems with the hare in the title, okay. One day, alas, an eagle flew above them, and before they knew what cloud had shadowed them, the hare hung from her talons in mid-air. Please spare my friend, the beetle cried, but the great eagle sneered with pride. You puny, servile, cloddish bug, go off, go off and hide your ugly mug. How do you dare assume the right to meddle with my appetite? This hare's my snack. Have you not heard? I am the great God Zeus's bird. Nothing can harm me, least of all a slow, pathetic, droning ball. Here, keep your friend's head. And she tore the hare's head off and swiftly bore his bleeding torso to her nest, ripped off his tail and ate the rest. The beetle stared at her friend's head and wished that she herself was dead. She mixed her tears with his dark blood and cloaked his face with clods of mud. She swore that till her dying breath she would avenge his cruel death, that she would make the eagle pay for what she had performed. Sorry. Um, water, anyone? Oh, Radna. My sister, I think, has got a problem with... Does she have enough water? She swore that till her dying breath, she would avenge his cruel death, that she would make the eagle pay for what she had performed today. Next day, she slowly tracked the trail from drop of blood to tuft of tail, till <coughs> high up on a mountain crest, she found the huge unguarded nest. And at the hour that yesterday the bird had plunged towards her prey, the beetle with her six short legs, rolled out the mighty eagle's eggs. She left at once, but she could hear the eagle's screams of pain and fear when later she returned and found the broken eggshells on the ground. Next day, the eagle moved her nest 
10 miles or more towards the west, but still the beetle's scrutiny followed her flight from rock to tree. When finally the eagle laid another clutch, the beetle made straight for the nest in which they lay, and when the bird was hunting prey, with much fatigue but little sound, rolled the great eggs onto the ground. When this had gone on for a year, the eagle, crazed with rage and fear, would turn back screeching in mid-air whenever she would sight a hare. The far drone of the eagle's flight shattered her calm by day or night. For weeks on end, she scarcely slept. She laid her eggs in grief and wept when what she feared had come to pass, and her smashed brood lay on the grass. At last she cried, what is the use of bearing your protection, Zeus, when that small evil clot of mud has massacred my flesh and blood? King of the gods, where may I rest? Where may I safely build my nest? Where lay my eggs without mishap? Here, said the god, here in my lap. And so the eggs lay more secure than they had ever lain before. What in the universe could be more safe than Zeus's custody. So thought the eagle, till one day the beetle saw them where they lay and aiming with precision, flung a microscopic ball of dung into the lap of mighty Zeus, who, rising, spewed divine abuse and shaking dirt from off his legs, unthinkingly tipped off the eggs. Past hope, the eagle pined away and died of grief. And to this day, they say that eagles will not nest in months when beetles fly their best. But others, not so superstitious, merely assert that fate's capricious and that the strong who crush the weak may not be shown the other cheek.